If you have your Bibles, if you would open them to the book of Acts, chapter 12. Last week, uh, we had a fantastic sermon. If you weren't able to be here, be sure to get to the website and listen to Pastor Mark Youngblood. What, what a great message last week in chapter 10 of Acts. I didn't know he was going to be in 10, and he didn't know I was going to be in 12 this week. Isn't that great how that works? And so I'm going to have him preach more, and that way I'll know what to do next. But uh, it was a powerful message, <clears throat> so I hope you can listen to it. But if you want to turn to Acts chapter 12, and just a little bit of context, when Jesus ascended into heaven, everybody assumed the religious leaders of that day would made the assumption that this whole Jesus thing is now over. This uprising that had been feared, this uprising of these crazy Christians who were following Jesus and seeing radical things happen, and it really messed up the political environment of the day, the church leaders as well. And so there was this assumption that this is just going to kind of die its own death, and, and soon we'll be done with this, this uprising in our world, as they were thinking of it. So that's how it was viewed. Now, what was interesting is if you back to Acts chapter 2, it, there's a, a statement in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2 that says they were enjoying all the favor of the people. So something has changed by the time you get to Acts chapter 12. The political leadership, I think, is changing. Religious leadership is changing. And so maybe they were enjoying some of the favor of the people. Genuinely, people were seeing things happen, wanted to be a part of whatever it was that was happening. But others were probably just willing to smile and pat them on the, on the back and say, it's going to be okay, you know. Again, assuming, as it happened many times in the past, that this leader would be like all the others, and it would come, and it would go, and it would go away. But that didn't happen. In fact, it kept growing even faster, starting at Pentecost. So religious leadership and political leadership is very, very uncomfortable with what is going on with these Christians. Let's read the story in chapter 12 of Acts. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each, 16 soldiers. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison. Look at this, verse 5. Peter was kept in prison, but, and here's where the story's going to change. Here's why the story's going to change. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought... He was seeing a vision, or maybe even dreaming a dream. They passed the first and second guards, came to the iron gate leading to the city, and it opened for them by itself. And they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself. Maybe he just kind of woke up. It wasn't a vision, it wasn't a dream, it was really happening. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where all those people had been praying, where the people had gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back in the house without opening the door and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. And being good, solid, mature, Bible-reading, Jesus-following Christians... They said, you're out of your mind. 
When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, no, 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 they, they probably already killed him. It's just his angel. There was this belief that maybe a, a, an angel would appear on behalf of the dead person and all that. You know, No, it's just his angel. Well, Peter had to keep knocking on door. Interesting, the prison doors opened clearly for him, but he got to those earnest prayer folks and couldn't get through the gate. So but they, Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> Peter motions with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Throughout history, I think we can say, certainly as we read the scriptures in that part of history, and there's still, I believe, things like this happening in this day and age, Christianity, uh, Christians have been misunderstood, criticized, even persecuted for their faith. Frankly, I believe there are some certain branches of those who would call themselves Christians that uh, bring a lot of ill will toward the rest of us. But throughout history, it's been a, a pattern, mainly in other places in the world, where Christian people were persecuted. There's places in the world today where this is happening. Now, the truth is, me, and I'm assuming most everybody in this room, we grew up in a world that knew nothing of that kind of resistance to Christ. And who knows what the future will bring. I often wonder, what will this world look like for believers when my grandchildren are 50 years old? What might it look like then? We can only pray and do our part while we have a chance. So we're going to learn something very important in the text. If you want to write this down, I've made some uh, way for you to do that on the back of your note page. And, and here's the first thing I would say. There are times we experience what we call inconvenient interruptions, but in reality, they may be divine invitations. And that's exactly what's going on in this text. Certainly being put in prison, particularly when you did nothing wrong, is a, an irritating and inconvenient interruption in your life. For the Apostle Peter, you've got to understand, we know him, unfortunately, many will know him as, oh, he's the one that denied Jesus three times. But really what we need to know him for is the fire that came out of this man when Jesus brought him back into ministry. And you see some of the sermons that Peter preached. He was, he was one of the most bold, outspoken leaders for Christ on the other side of the resurrection. Very bold, bold preaching. Great sermons in the book of Acts that, that Peter would preach. So we don't like inconvenience or aggravation, things that disrupt our plans or our calendars, our schedules. And I think, frankly, today's a great day to kind of do an inventory of our spiritual life and assess whether or not we're really allowing God to speak to us. A lot of people will say, well, is God closer? I mean, why isn't God closer? And this, this new series, we'll spend today in the next three weeks on this. But I think what, what I often learn is that when I'm wondering, God, where are you? He's been there all along. I just wasn't slowing down long enough to give him a chance to talk. Like sometimes I do to Kim. <laughs> Marty, if you'd be quiet, I'd love to answer your question. There's no pulpit in the house. It's at the church. <laughs> if we would just step back a little. What if we planned, so let's go home this afternoon and let's get our calendars out or our whatever device you use or, no, or whatever you use to, to keep your calendar straight and plan all your days out. What if we said, okay, from now on, let's just say that, let's just throw it out from from four to six, I'm not gonna have anything going other than the job that's in front. I mean, some of us have to work until maybe six. Maybe from six to 7.30, maybe seven to nine. Somewhere in this week, I'm going to have time that is not spoken for. So I can sit still long enough, maybe read the Bible a little bit, maybe pray a little bit, and then I'll find out that Jesus has been closer than I thought. He's been there all along. I mean, there's, there's some excitement in this thought that he's always present, 
And then when you think of times you'd rather him not be present or be around. So there are inconvenient interruptions at time that many could turn out, if, we're, if we just be open to it, to really be a divine invitation. So before we jump into this 12th chapter, there, I think we go back. I want to go back to chapter 11 for just a minute because I think it puts chapter 12 in context for us. So in chapter 11, you find this verse. Uh, it's a great verse. And this is the f uh, first thing we're going to learn. You can write this on your notes. This is really the first lesson of this story. And it's this. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Now, what is the big deal about that? Well, it's just kind of interesting that right here in the middle of, of two chapters, you know, there's this powerful story with Cornelius that, that pastor preached on last week that Mark spoke about. And again, I hope you listen to it. And then in 12, we're reading today about this miraculous thing that happens for Peter in prison. But here in verse 11, some, you, you see this, this uprising that the political and, and the religious leadership is trying to squelch is just growing like crazy. And so here's what's interesting. These people were first called Christians at Antioch. Now that word Christian, if you did, peel the onion all the way back to what it must have meant at that time, if you take it right out of the Greek and look at it, there's a lot of conclusions about the word Christian, but here was, here was three words that I felt really summed it up. What's it mean, Christians? That means the Christ people. Those Christ people. Now, why were they called that? Because they were following Jesus. They were doing what he taught them to do. They were witnessing to what they had seen happen, and they were seeing it continue to happen. The disciples followed because they had been touched. Their lives had changed. They had been healed. Their personal lives changed. Their home life changed. Their family life changed. Their business life changed. Their community life changed. See, it all had so much meaning to them. And they were so aggressive about it. And they were so eager to share it that they became known as the Christ people. In our text today, I think we see Peter experiencing a situation that none of us would want. And that's our second lesson that we draw from, from this, uh, this chapter. Peter finds himself closer to God in a prison cell. In some ways, he might be comparing this moment as maybe the time he's been, he could, hadn't been any closer to God other than the actual presence of Jesus. Perhaps he would never forget that moment when he realized Jesus was willing to forgive him for doing what Jesus told him he was going to do and deny him. Maybe Peter reflected back, that had to be the, the pinnacle moment of my life when I realized that Jesus was willing to forgive me and use me yet again, sinner that I am. And then I think he would probably remember this moment along the highest moments of his life. Maybe those two things he might remember. He was very close to God in that prison cell. God showed up in that place. I think that's one of the things that continues to draw me into our prison ministries for women and men because God is very much present there. There's a hunger for him. There are a lot of men and women who wish they'd been told this story a long time ago. So Peter finds himself closer to God than really he'd been in his eyes probably since Jesus physically left the planet. He's being guarded by 16 soldiers over, around the clock, uh, four squads of four each. He's asleep between two soldiers. He's bound with two chains, guards at the entrance of the cell and the prison. In other words, he's not leaving there. And he assumed really the next day there would probably be some kind of a trial. It'd be a mock trial. And the end goal here was that Peter would die as well. And I think he had every reason to assume that was going to happen the next day. But here's what I love about the story. When you start seeing the angel showing up in prison, he, the, the angel goes over and says, and, and I'll, I'll, let's look at that again. It's verse, um, the angel, it's verse six. So the angel, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood at the entrance of the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared in the light shone in the cell. Here it is. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. 
that did two things for me. One, it reminded me as a dad when the kids would want to all sleep in front of the TV on a Friday night, and we'd go in the next morning, and we'd go, hey, wake up. It didn't hurt him. We weren't abusing him. No bruises. Just, hey, get up. Time to get up. You can't sleep all day. <laughs> Being the father that I was, actually preferring to sleep all day at that moment because they'd been up all night, but that's what it struck me was that, hey, and, and the other thing that struck me when I read that sentence was, look at the peace this man in chains had that he just went on to sleep. Man, on some of those nights when I let stuff get to me and I let something keep me up at night, I, I wish I could have that kind of peace and just say, you know what, it's in God's hands. I'm going to go to sleep. And when I wake up, we'll figure it out. It's in his hands. But I, I love that verse. He finds himself closer to God than he's ever been. And then he, he's woken up, kind of, you know, given a little nudge to get up out of his sleep and follow this angel out of the door. And then he has this moment where he realizes this is real. This is really happening. This isn't a vision. This isn't a dream. This is real. I'm out of prison. I'm now standing in the middle of the city on this one street that the angel had walked him down. And so what does he do? He heads straight to the house where the church had gathered for prayer. Now let's understand something. This is probably the middle of the night. It doesn't necessarily say that. I'm going to assume that for a minute. But everybody was asleep, so it would seem to be that it was long past bedtime. And isn't it interesting that in the middle of the night, he heads right where he knows people are praying. And they were. They were praying. It says, if, the third thing we're going to learn here is that Peter's friends found themselves closer to God in that moment as well. They found their moment closer to God in the, prayer, in the prayer time inside the living room while Peter found his close moment with God inside a prison cell. And Peter goes straight to them. And it says that they were praying earnestly. It said they were, they were in earnest prayer. Take, take a look at that word if you want to dig back a little bit and, and get some definition about that earnest. What's that mean? And basically it means this. Earnest prayer means wholehearted, urgent pleading with God. Around the clock. Maybe they slept in shifts. Who knows? That's not the point. The point is they were praying earnestly. And, and to give you a sense of what that might look like, earnest prayer, this is kind of a hand raised, both hands raised or hands outstretched or laying face down on the floor and, and bowing in humility before God, which was not uncommon in those days to just fall on your face and pray. That's earnest prayer. That's what's going on here. And, and I just love this part where Peter finds himself free, heads to the place where they're praying and knocks on the door. And some sweet servant girl whose job was just to do those kinds of details finds herself close to God too. Finds herself in the middle of a miracle. And as we know, the people that were praying really didn't think much of what she said. They didn't believe her. That brings me to the fourth lesson. I've always loved this part of this story. Sometimes the answer to your prayer is standing at the door. Sometimes the answer to your prayer is right there. We just can't see it yet. Sometimes our eyes are busy and we're not looking Sometimes we're looking the wrong directions. Sometimes we're so busy trying to fix our predicament on our own that we fail to realize that God is right there with the solution if we would just recognize him. Sometimes the answer to your prayers standing at the door. God did what Peter could not do for himself. When he was powerless, God was powerful. When Peter realized he was really free, he gave glory to God. He went straight to the praying folks, let them know what had happened, and then it says he moved on. Why do we often feel so close to God in times of trouble 
Well, that's easy because we need him more when we're in trouble. We're a lot more interested in finding him and feeling him when we're in trouble. But what if we really lived? What if we prayed and drew close to God ourselves? He'll pursue you, but you've got to respond to him. What if we were such praying people and we took advantage of the hundred or so Bible studies that I think you'll find or small groups that you would find any given week in this church and decide, I just don't want to go to church. I want to be a part of a church that helps me understand how incredibly blessed we are to know Jesus and how we can serve him and how we can love him and how we can be an earnest prayer warrior. He's promised to never leave us. Think of Deuteronomy 31.8. Joshua 1, 5, Deuteronomy 31, 6, John 14, Holy Spirit is given. He's promised cover to cover, he's with us. We have hope. We're forgiven. We can overcome. He's closer than you realize. I want to take the end of this message and take you to a place that's very special to this church a place where we would have maybe difficulty if we were in those shoes that I'm about to show you, feeling very close to God. In a place that truly suffers things that only we can imagine. We'll watch it on the evening news and it seems to happen so frequently we don't give it much thought really. Several years ago, a, a wonderful group, a wonderful couple, Camille and Hoda Melke felt led to start a ministry in their homeland of Lebanon, Beirut, Lebanon. Hearts for Lebanon. We had the privilege of being one of the first congregations to walk alongside them. And it has truly been our privilege. I mean, it's been our joy and privilege to be able to do this. So I want to take you there and show you how close and how powerful God is to a group of people in a place that most of us would never want to go to. Have a look at the screens. I can assure you, I've Never heard a couple ever talk about planning a wedding in the middle of bombs. Yeah. In an atmosphere where you weren't sure you'd even live through the event. Our plan was to get married later in 1990, but unfortunately, early in the year, in January, the war between different fighting factions in Lebanon broke out again. And my parents had uh, purchased a small apartment for the two of us to move into when we get married. That apartment got bombed. So my uncle, Pastor Fouad, came with this brilliant idea. Well, let's uh, marry this couple and ship them out of the country. We're not seeing any weddings in the community, but we're seeing a lot of funerals. And uh, it was very sad, dark times in the history of Lebanon. We had 75 people uh, that risked their life to attend this wedding. Uh, an hour after our wedding, we're running for our lives. And as we ourselves were crossing to the second part of Beirut so we can catch a flight the next day, snipers started shooting at us. And uh, we made it eventually to the hotel. You know, your first night, what you're doing, you're sitting up uh, on, out on the balcony looking at Beirut burning in flame. The next morning, we traveled to uh, the airport to uh, go to Cyprus. And at the airport, I was arrested by the Syrian army who had control of our uh, uh, airport. So I'm telling you, you know, the first 24 hours of our life were, as a married couple was all uh, uh, based with God's protection. You had a wonderful opportunity to never come back to Lebanon. And coming back to Lebanon, to me, would have felt like uh, you're almost guaranteeing that your life will end much sooner than you would prefer. You know, if we fast forward, we're taking our, our wedding in 1990. And in 2006, we as a couple with our two young daughters and 13 other teenagers 
came to the United States to attend the Church of God International Youth Convention. We were in uh, Los Angeles uh, when uh, the first night of the convention, we heard that uh, the war in Lebanon broke out again. A 33-day war erupted and there was a total embargo on Lebanon. So even if we desired to return, we were not allowed to. Uh, our airports was totally bombed. All the ports were closed. We started arguing with God this why question. Why God? Every time we think something good is happening in Lebanon and the ministry is picking up speed and uh, we're seeing growth and fruit of the ministry, another crisis take place in Lebanon. The U.S. was a, a, a place of refuge for us during those months. But we wanted to make sure that it is in God's plan for us to decide to live here permanently. And in that time of uh, prayer, we were reflecting on this beautiful story in the uh, Gospels where the disciples brought this young man, blind young man to Jesus and asked him this question, why is he blind? Uh, wh whose sins is he paying the price for? His sins or the sins of his parents? And Jesus' answer was so beautiful. Neither, but for the name of the Lord to be honored and glorified. You see, uh, we were rebuked at that time. We were rebuked because we we're asking the why question rather than asking the how question. How then, Lord? In the midst of this, this state of despair, your name will be honored and glorified. So we chose to return not long after and the Heart for Lebanon was burst out from those two experiences in a nation in despair and a couple who were seeking God's calling in their life. And so it's now been 13 years. Tell us what it looks like today. Today, Heart for Lebanon on every given month is reaching out to 1900 Syrian refugee families. This is a family of seven to nine. So you can imagine uh, roughly around uh, 18 to 20,000 individuals that we care for on every given month. What was such an overwhelming crisis in 2006 was only a lesson for us, a, a field for us to prepare us to what's coming next. In 2011, when the war in Syria began, hundreds of thousands of Syrians started crossing the borders into the country of Lebanon. Today, Lebanon is considered as the largest per capita host of refugees worldwide. This tiny Mediterranean coast nation of 4 million has the largest refugee per capita than any other nation in the world. We were ready as a ministry to reach out to the refugee population. We were the first faith-based organization to love on and care for the refugees that are coming across the mountains. So we were not indifferent to the refugees. We're not only caring for their physical needs, but we had to be put to the test. Do we really mean what we have always said, that we're ready to forgive? You see, it's easy to talk about forgiveness when your enemy is across the border. It's much harder to live out forgiveness when your enemy now is in your own territory, reminding you of every story. We have seen loved ones being killed during the Civil War. We have lost family members. And now we're called to care for that same occupier that one time occupied our land for 30 years. But also it's a great example what the love of Christ could do when you surrender yourself in the hands of our Lord. He has transformed our lives to be agent of grace, agent of his forgiveness to the ones that we fear the most. Uh, the way we reach out to the refugee family is we provide basic food and hygiene supplies, blankets and warm clothing, medical clinics, education for their children, hygiene supplies and health awareness training. This is our access into the life of the families that we're called to serve. We're talking about people, real people who have suffered so much Today, we have 30 weekly Bible study and discipleship mm. program, 30 opportunities to tell them more about Jesus. We have on the average in any one of our three centers in the south of Lebanon, in the Bika, and in Beirut, around 350 to 400 individuals in those Bible studies on a weekly basis, individuals 
who want to know more about Christ. We celebrate what God is doing in our midst. We celebrate the fact that today we have brothers and sisters in large numbers who declare him as savior. So our hope center is the opportunity to help this migrant refugee fleeing a war-torn country in Syria, coming to Lebanon, the first contact point, the Bekaa Valley, its capital, Zahli. That's where we're building a 54,000 square foot center. In it, there, there will be a medical clinic, a food distribution center, a school. We believe our calling in the future, starting early in 2019, is to prepare workers to go back to Syria, reverse that migration route. Maybe not in the large numbers of those who had fled, but in quality of sending people who God is calling to help rebuild the communities in Syria. Thank you for joining us in telling the Beirut story. But we also know that you're telling many other stories. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for helping us help others move from despair to Ladies and gentlemen, Camille and Hoda Melki are with us today. <laughs> Back in the fall, uh, the Melkies were here in the United States and spent some time here in Oklahoma City. That's when we sat down for the interview. But as I said earlier, we've been a part of this wonderful couple and their ministry for a lot of years. And you saw the building they're building, 56,000 square feet. And uh, so we were able, because of your generosity, you know, we tithe on your tithe. And so when that come, money comes in, and sometimes there's more than we planned for, and we always put that to use. So between the dollar club and missions funds that we had because of your tithing, we were able to give them a gift of $60,000 toward the building. And um, So they will be available. They'll be right down here in the front after the service. We're gonna share communion together here in a moment, and then they'll be available here for you all to meet and talk to and get to know. Thank you so much for being here. Wow. How appropriate is it that on a day we're talking about or launching this series on being closer to God, we will take a step that Jesus himself asked us to do with bread and cup. So simple, so powerful, and yet we're gonna get taken as we hold the bread and cup right back to that moment when he first said, whenever you get together, Let's do this so you'll remember. Remember that we've been forgiven. Remember the cross and remember that he is with us and never leaves us. We ask everyone to share communion with us. It has nothing to do with being a member of a church. It's about understanding the body and blood of Christ. So please share it with us if you like. And if you don't feel like taking communion, you don't, there'll be no pressure at all. You do what's best for you in this moment. We'll wait till we've all been served and then we'll share it together at that time. I'm gonna ask the ushers to go ahead and come and prepare to serve the congregation. And as they come, let me pray for us. Father, we're humbled and thankful for the privilege we have to see how close you really are in our highest moments and lowest. And yet, Father, today we're so thankful you found us worthy enough and you loved us enough to send Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. So Father, help us to reflect on this as we've been asked to do and remember the sacrifice that was made that we might have life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.